Welcome to this edition of the World Stage Podcast. Uh, my name is Cedric de Koenig. I'm a research professor here at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. And today we're going to have a conversation about climate, peace and security. We have with us uh, Aaron Sikorsky, who's the director of the Center for Climate and Security. And Aaron, you're also the director of the International Military Council on Climate and Security. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, fantastic. And we also have two NUPI colleagues uh, in the room. I'm going to ask them to, to introduce themselves shortly, but the, the three of us, the NUPI colleagues, are all working together on our, on our climate, peace and security project. So, Minu. So, my name is Seminu Kofut, and I'm a senior research fellow here at NUPI at the Climate, Peace and Security project. My name is Toru Lovivishen, and I'm also a senior research fellow here at NUPI uh, to a large extent engaged with climate, peace and security as a topic. Fantastic. So let's let's start off by asking Aaron to introduce the topic of climate security in the context that you work on it. Um, and maybe in that context also introduce maybe your background and, and how you've come to the topic of climate security. Sure. Happy, happy to do that. I think, you know, from the Center for Climate and Security's perspective and the, the U.S. perspective, we look at climate and security in, in kind of a bi-directional way, right? How is climate change reshaping the national security landscape? Um, but then also, how does security shape uh, and geopolitics shape the possibilities for climate action as well, right? Um, and we're a very practitioner, policy-focused organization, so looking at not only the analysis, right, of those relationships, but then also the policies that need to be put in place to better climatize security policies, right, make governments more resilient in the face of climate change. Um, and, and I came to these issues, so I come from a security background, not a climate background at all. I worked in the U.S. intelligence community for many years on instability and conflict in the Middle East and Africa, but kept seeing climate and environment issues playing a role. I mean, I spent a lot of time focused on al-Shabaab in Somalia, and you can't understand that issue without understanding the role that drought has played there, right, and the role of non-state actors in responding to those types of hazards. Anyway, just got more interested in, in that relationship and also in, frankly, the weaknesses within the U.S. security community and understanding the climate and environment picture. Um, so worked on those issues on the environment side in the intelligence community then for a while. Uh, and, and when I was looking to leave government, I knew of CCS and its work, and it just seemed like a really good opportunity to continue to bridge this gap together. So um, I will say... I think in the U.S. now, we've gotten to a place where across most of the security agencies, there's agreement that climate is an important issue and something that they need to better understand and address. Uh, but now it's the hard part of like, well, what does that mean? What do we do about it? And how, when other priorities come up, whether it's the Russian invasion of Ukraine or what's happening in Gaza, right, or competition with China, how do we not lose sight of the climate issues or better integrate it? So... That's a little bit about where I'm coming from. Mm. Well, it's so nice to have you visiting us today and for us to, to have this conversation. Um, yeah, our work on, on climate, peace and security started really when Norway was an elected member of the Security Council and climate security was one of the four priority areas for Norway. And uh, we were asked together with uh, our colleagues at CIPRI to backstop some of the work that Norway was doing through providing information and analysis on some of the countries that are on the agenda of the Security Council. So it was really about summarizing, you know, what is the available knowledge on, for instance, you mentioned Somalia, you know, on, for instance, uh, uh, the linkages, the relationship between climate change and security in a context like Somalia or, or other such areas. So that was really in, a, in, a, in, a, in the context that we became involved in the topic but we are of course also very interested in the topic in our own uh, neighborhood so i'll, I'll ask uh, Mini to say a few words about how climate change is also affecting social cohesion in norway and in the nordic countries which is one of the areas that we're interested in and um, through our work <clears throat> with the security council we have also become quite interested in in you know how is 
the politics of climate change and climate security also in, in, in um, becoming part of the geopolitical debate. And that's something that uh, Tor Olof can also say a few words about that, something that he's working on at the moment. And um, one thing we can also come back to is our work also in support of the African Union in, in their work in developing a common African position on climate peace and security. But um, maybe let me go to, to Mino first. And uh, if you share a bit for us, Mino, about how we also see climate peace and security in, in the Norwegian and Nordic context. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I would say that the majority of the existing literature on the climate security nexus is predominantly focusing on the relationships between climate change uh, or extreme weather events on the one side and violent armed conflicts. Uh, and also like the, the connections between um, uh, humanitarian catastrophes and humanitarian issues uh, and human security, obviously, like, as it relates to uh, climate change. But in the so in the in a Nordic context, um, since <laughs> societies here are different, so to speak, uh, we have to think about the uh, climate security nexus in a little bit different way. So here, for instance, instead of looking at uh, uh, direct conflict or put the, like the hard security aspects uh, in uh, in my work I'm more focusing on the how climate change influence uh, more uh, indirect or low intense conflicts uh, and especially how it might um, impact on all already marginalized communities for instance we have an indigenous community uh, the Sami, Sami people in Norway there has been a lot of uh, a lot of political uh, conflicts and disputes concerning, uh, for instance, certain implications of uh, tre green transition uh, uh, for the Sami communities. Um, some argue that, uh, for instance, the production of uh, or the, um, uh, the, the wind power plants um, in, in Sami areas have a negative impact on the reindeer herding and other traditional livelihoods for these indigenous people of Norway. Uh, so then there's a kind of a direct connection between the, the efforts that Norway is actually doing uh, to, to, to combat climate change uh, and then on, on this already marginalized community. So there's this, yeah, that those kinds of connections and it creates um, it c creates uh, l perhaps uh, limited uh, trust between the, the Sami community on the one hand and uh, uh, the companies and the certain state actors in Norway. So there's uh, certain social cohesion issues that kind of relate to this dimension in, uh, in the Nordic and Norwegian context. As an example, yeah. Can I ask some questions about that? Because I'm, I'm so glad to hear that you're focused on that issue because I think too often we only focus on places that are already in crisis, right? I sometimes joke that I don't never want to read another uh, climate security report on the Sahel. Not that it's not important, but there's been so much spotlight effect there that I think we're missing some of the bigger issues. And, you know, the national intelligence estimate that the U.S. intelligence community did on climate, at the very end, there's a great line in it about how um, disruptive climate issues will be even in wealthy countries, right? And that it will be very challenging to maintain social cohesion. It's buried at the end, so it doesn't get a lot of attention. But I think that's where I'd love to see more of the research go, just because I think in the next 10 to 15 years, it's going to be so much more challenging than we expect, frankly. Um, anyway, but the question I want to ask you is, have you looked at all, is, is disinformation or misinformation playing a role in any of that social cohesion conversation? Because I know in the U.S., as you just saw with the hurricanes there and the role that disinformation has been playing, it's been a huge challenge. And I'm just curious if that's happening here as well. I mean, to my knowledge, that has not been a big part mm. of the debates here in Norway, but mm. I'm sure that, that if we would look into that as a, as a research topic, basically, to as an empirical sphere of, for, uh, for investigation, I'm, I, it absolutely might be so that that plays uh, into, uh, 
uh, to the situations also here in Norway. I don't know if uh, the two of you have some uh, more inputs on that. Well, what I was going to say is that it's it's interesting, I mean, to look at the Norwegian example, but of course it's the vast majority of countries, I would say, are, you know, not conflict affected. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm actually traveling tonight to Zambia mm -hmm. and uh, we'll be having a meeting there next week to follow up on some previous research and engagements we had there. And that's another example of a country that's not conflict affected, but certainly they can see the effects of climate change on social cohesion in various ways. And I find it almost uh, the, the interlinkage between you know, climate change, of course, through um, the effects of weather variability on especially food security, land access, water. Um, you see the linkage is almost clearer when there isn't the conflict that overwhelms, the, the symptoms of the conflict that kind of overwhelms your attention. And so in a place like Zambia or, or in the example that Minu mentioned, in Norway, you can see the tensions building up even more clearly, you know, over time. Um, so that's, I find that, that uh, broader approach to, and so one of the things that, that we are grappling with is how do we describe this phenomenon that we're dealing with? Because climate security gives it a certain flavor and it's a certain element around what you include and exclude when you use that terminology. But if, you, if we try to describe this kind of broader phenomenon of the kind of social impact of climate change, um, that's something that we're trying to, to grapple with. But let me go to, to Tor Olaf to talk a little bit precisely about how this climate security terminology is, is also something that we see in our research at the Security Council playing out as a part of a kind of geopolitical rivalry. Uh, thank you very much, Cedric. Um, so, uh, climate peace and security—it's been or climate security—it's uh, a very become a very interesting example, I think, of uh, environmental issues entering the very highest echelons of international politics. So, I think the first instance of uh, mention of climate change and climate security in the UN Security Council that was in 2007 by the UK. But really from around 2018, there was this, uh, has been this gradual development where it's come more and more on the agenda. And that culminated in 2021 when Ireland and Niger um, uh, promoted a resolution um, on, on, on climate uh, security, um, which was in turn vetoed by Russia. Um, so there's been, there is a lot of contest contestation around the issue, which is, uh, and the broader agenda, which is very interesting, I think. Um, so the um, opponents, uh, obviously Russia has been quite fiercely opposed to this agenda, but also uh, countries like uh, India uh, and China and Brazil have also uh, been uh, quite opposed to, I would say, uh, a climate security agenda more uh, broadly, but they also have fairly like nuanced positions. Um, China, for instance, they openly recognize that climate change can, in some instance, instances, uh, impact conflicts and that this actually happens. So they're open to that, but they don't really want to discuss it as a general issue and agenda. They, I think, uh, in, in, in one um, diplomatic statement, they consider that so-called unscientific. Uh, which is a, a rather interesting stance, I have to say. Um, and we know also that in, in China, uh, talking about the effects of um, climate change on food security and on energy infrastructure and things like this is very much accepted. So uh, I, I do th actually think that framing is rather important here. Um, and, and another issue that I wanted to shortly bring up is that uh, traditionally, some of these diplomatic dynamics, they've been described as a, a group of donor countries and the global north sort of imposing this agenda on the global south. But we've, what we've seen, and especially the last years, is that really some of the driving countries of this agenda is, are particularly a wide range of African countries and institutions. And then I'm talking countries like uh, Ghana, Mozambique, Gabon, uh, Kenya. So uh, very different countries linguistically and geographically and culturally uh, and also African institutions like the African Union and uh, and especially also uh, EGOD. Um, 
Uh, so uh, those countries, in addition to the uh, small island developing states, also play very por- important parts in this agenda. So it's not really uh, a- an issue that so- that neatly lends itself to sorting the country into categories like the global north and global south. That it's really interesting. I was interested in watching the debate over the pact for the future. And, and Turkey, I think, was in opposition to the climate security language, which I thought was interesting. And I, I find China's role really fascinating, too, because, you know, they did sign on to the Relief, Recovery and Peace Declaration at COP. And so that seems, which is obviously non-binding and, and just a statement of, you know, kind of thumbs up to, to these issues. But but they've, they've kind of walked the line there. There is nuance, as, as you were saying. Yeah, it's very interesting, I think, to see the debate at the COP for instance, right? Because we, especially when we we started getting engaged in in this work around the Security Council, there was this notion that, you know, we should separate climate security as something that's a debate in Security Council, and we should, in a sense, ring fence, you know, the COP debate at somewhere where where you don't want to bring security issues in. But, um, I mean, Turol have mentioned Kenya and others that I think also in the Security Council kind of started saying, but hang on, if we're going to talk about climate security, we should also talk about climate finance and loss and damage because these issues are all interlinked. And it was interesting then to see how this uh, topic is coming increasingly also into the, the COP discussions, not on the formal agenda, but, you know, through the through the, through these side events and through this introduction of the day of peace and relief and recovery. And uh, so, I mean, one of the things we're also interested in is trying to, to track the framing of the language at the COP context to see, you know, how is that different from the framing in the Security Council context? And does that give us indications of, you know, how, what are the, what framings are a broader group of countries perhaps more comfortable with mm. than, than others? Interesting. I know on the on the climate finance front, one thing we're focused on in a U.S. context, I mean, it's no secret that the U.S. is not uh, meeting its obligations or promises around climate finance, and it's a bipartisan problem, frankly. It's not just a, a Republican problem. Um, and so we've been trying to think about how do you make the national security case for investments in climate finance? Uh, because whether it's buying down future risk, right, preventing instability and conflict, or a geopolitical argument as well, that this is what our allies and partners, especially in the Indo-Pacific, put at the top of their threat list, right, climate. And so um, we need to be the partner of choice who's showing up. Um, and that, that's a complicated argument, though, because it... Th- there's a domestic political reason to make that argument in the U.S., but then in the international sphere, countries don't want the, the aid to be contingent on being on side with the U.S., obviously, right? Um, so we're, we're trying to, to think through that, and I think especially in the context of a, a new administration in the U.S., whether Republican or Democrat, um, you know, there isn't going to be the, – the, it's going to be an uphill battle to increase funds for, for climate finance. Do you find in in Washington that if you frame climate change as a security issue, you get more attention from uh, the president or, or or other senior political figures? Uh, yes, I think so. And I mean, clearly, this the Biden administration has framed it that way from day one and really put it front and center. And it is a way to have a different conversation on on Capitol Hill about it. Um, I, and so I think I think that's helpful, but I think it's not just an instrumental argument, right? It's actually true, also, right? It is a, it is a security threat, um, and I think on the the climate finance front, I think one of the challenges for the U.S. is just you know things like the Green Climate Fund or any multilateral fund are always a, a, a non-starter with many politicians, and so being more creative and thinking about how can we deliver the finance, but is it through bilateral uh, approaches? Is it through sectoral programming around food security, for example, which does seem to have bipartisan support in the U.S.? Um, Is it just making sure existing development programming or humanitarian aid is really climate strong and not leading to maladaptation? Um, I've seen some interesting work looking at remittances as a pathway to try and increase, uh, especially for uh, early warning or climate adaptation. Um, but I, I think 
when I think of like the next frontier in the U.S. kind of climate security conversation, I do think it's this, uh, how do you build global resilience, right? And how do we build um, the right mechanisms to provide that kind of support? I think the conversation around the military itself and like it building its own resilience or it decarbonizing, that's on a relatively positive track in the U.S. And, and I don't worry about that as much um, as I worry about these other issues in the, in the broad climate security sphere. But yeah. But from a broad climate security sphere, maybe people are not so aware of, of you know, why this is an issue for the military and how the military see it. So maybe you can just tell us a little bit about how the U.S. military see climate change and why it is an issue for them and what steps they are taking to to integrate that into their planning and thinking? Sure, happy happy to do that. I mean, you know, the military is very pragmatic, right? And they're very mission focused. And I think they recognize that climate change and climate hazards impact their ability to conduct their mission, right? So especially the regional combatant commands for the US, um, AFRICOM, the African Command, for example, has been at the forefront of um, advocating for more climate sensitive uh, approaches, both in understanding the risks and how that might reshape risks on the continent, but also then support to allies and partners on the continent um, and what they need to manage climate risks. So that that's kind of one piece of it is the bigger picture, strategic, conceptual understanding of, of conflict and risk. And then there's also the transition to clean energy peace. Um, obviously, the U.S. military is the largest uh, emitter in, in the United States and, and much bigger than many countries. Um, I think that's because the U.S. is a big emitter and militaries reflect the societies they sit within, right? But but they, there's a growing recognition that um, that's not sustainable in the future, that as the world decarbonizes, the, the military has to follow. And there are, there are operational benefits to doing so, right? Um, in a world of contested supply chains, um, worry about access to resources, also operationally on the battlefield, you know, if you can operate without a heat signature, for example, right, that's, that's a benefit. Um, so each of the military branches in the U.S. has created its own climate strategy uh, with pretty ambitious goals to 2030. Um, I imagine those will go away if we get a Trump administration, right? Um, but I think some of the work that the military is doing in this realm will continue regardless of the White House because the military is a big institution. It has a lot of inertia. So when you start moving in a direction, uh, you're going to keep moving in that way. And you've got a lot of recognition across the enterprise that it's just the direction of travel more broadly and they need to move in that that's very interesting because in our, our work with the UN and Security Council, of course, one element is how UN peacekeeping operations view climate change as well. Yeah. And we see the same, you know, broad two strands. On the one hand, you know, it's about emissions and it's about having a green footprint. It's also about how, you know, in, in, in some smaller countries, a UN peacekeeping operation is also quite a big entity. and. Uh, when they adopt solar or, or other green approaches to energy, that's also something that can be a catalyst in terms of uh, the relations with the local country and kickstarting, for instance, energy uh, trans or energy energy generation uh, processes that can stay even when the peacekeeping operation leaves. But at the moment, there's also interesting work going on in trying to understand how is climate change impacting the ability of peacekeeping operations to achieve their primary mandate? So, for instance, protection of civilians or providing support to humanitarian assistance. And this then often has a lot to do about, uh, for instance, access to communities in need. So in a place like South Sudan, where you have a lot of flooding and peacekeepers can't reach a community to provide, to support the provision of humanitarian assistance or to provide protection, then it's also about, okay, how do we change our, you know, equipment? Do we maybe need to have boats uh, or, or other ways of reaching communities? So that's interesting debate in the UN context as well. Yeah. The, the other thing that we've been tracking at the center is how often militaries are being deployed in response to climate-driven hazards. So we started the Military Response to Climate Hazards Tracker, or MERCH, <laughs> a couple of years ago. Um, and it's open source, and just any time that we see a military deployed globally, and I think we're up to about 420 deployments over the past two years in about 90, 95 countries. 
around the world. And so this is mostly in response to natural disasters? Or? Exactly. So floods, wildfires, um, extreme heat, uh, other extreme precipitation. Um, so we don't, you know, we don't have attribution studies for every hazard to show that it was climate, but of the type driven mm. by climate mm. change. Mm. Um, and September of this year was the most deployments ever that we've seen. And it was actually upwards of hundreds of thousands of military uh, uh, members deployed globally, the Philippines, Vietnam, Nigeria, China, the United States, of course, um, Poland, right, which had its, the, the its, um, chief of defense said it was their biggest military mission ever in response to Storm Boris. Um, so I think that is going to be an interesting challenge in the coming years. You already see it in some militaries where there's real debate over should we be the first line of response. It's distracting from other mission capabilities. Canada last summer with the fires. Um, Australia, it's been a debate there as well. But then you see some countries in, in sub-Saharan Africa or Latin America that are really leaning into it, too, building green battalions, and you know it's going to be their primary mission. So I think that's an interesting mm. research question. We would love to continue the conversation, but I, I think we're running out of time. So Erin, thank you so much for visiting us. It was great having you together with Minu and Tor Olaf and in this conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me.